Greetings in the matchless name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. It's my privilege to come before you with the word today. So let's start with a word of prayer. Hallelujah, Lord. We thank you, Lord, for this day, Father. We thank you because you reign above every situation. And today, as we are, uh, we are going to come together to hear your word, Holy Spirit, I just pray that you will, uh, you will touch hearts, either here or even in their homes, Lord, and you will set people free of uh, wrong ideas or mindsets, Lord. And I pray that what I speak will be pleasing to you. Thank you, Lord. I just commit this word into your hands, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. So last week, uh, we heard the word, the truth has set you free. And that is such a, uh, one of my favorite verses because truly the truth sets us free. But many times uh, we think we're walking in truth, but there may be areas of deception. And uh, it's easy to understand, you know, an, an outright lie is very obvious, but a subtle deception really many times we don't even realize it. You know, when we came here in the morning, it was raining heavily. And uh, even uh, there's the water going through a pipe between uh, this ho the side hall and uh, the toilets. And the, the pipe overflowed and all the water was falling on the, on the place, so you couldn't get to the toilet and instead of going through the pipe to the end. And I was looking what happened, and I just saw that it was full of leaves. I was thinking the same way the truth tries to come through and come and it's supposed to go to the end. But instead, because of some deceptions, sometimes that truth is not able to set us free. So that's why today the Lord gave me this word to share amongst you all that we shouldn't be deceived. John of Kennedy says, the great enemy of truth is very often not the lie, deliberate, contrived and dishonest, but the myth persistent, persuasive, and unrealistic. It's so true. Actually, this verse, you know, in John chapter 8, verse 34, where, where it says how uh, the truth will, Jesus says that if you hear my word, and ab if you abide in my word, you'll be my disciples, and you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. Jesus is speaking to some Jewish believers, and uh, they were believers. They may not have been disciples, and uh, they suddenly say, we are the descendants of Abraham. We are free. How can you say that we're in bondage? And Jesus says to them, if you have committed sin, you are a slave to sin and you are no longer free. And for that, the Son of Man has come to set you free. And they were annoyed. They were offended. And they, they said that he was demon possessed to the point that in the end of that paragraph, they say, it says that they tried to stone him. So even though Jesus had come with the truth, they were deceived, so they couldn't accept it. Um, in Mark chapter 13, verses 5 and 6, Jesus is talking about the end times. And Jesus says, he, Jesus answered them and began to say, Take heed that no one deceives you, for many will come in my name, saying, I am he, and will deceive many. And so if the Lord has to give us that warning, these are those end, those times, those end times we're entering, and we really need to take heed. Let's look at the first instance of deception in the Bible. All of you all know it's in Genesis where um, Adam and Eve were allowed to eat all the, the fruit of all the trees except the tree in the middle of the garden. And, uh, but in this chapter 3, the serpent comes, uh, Satan comes as a serpent to, e to Eve and kind of asks her, what, uh, what did God say to you? And she says, we can eat all the, uh, uh, of all the trees except the one in the middle. We can't even touch it and because we'll die. And what does Satan reply in Genesis 3, verse 4 and 5? It says, then the serpent said to the woman, you will not surely die. For God knows that in the day you eat of it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. So actually, that was a half-truth. You will not surely die. She, actually, even though there was no physical death, there was a spiritual death that happened when Eve sinned. There was a separation from God. And uh, not only that, say the, uh, Satan said, Your eye, you will be like God. Actually, Adam and Eve were made in the image of God. They were already like God. They couldn't have been closer to God. And so that was another deception. 
in, in what uh, Satan said. And Eve succumbs, we know that. Because she saw, in verse 6 it says, So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, that it was pleasant to the eyes, and a tree desirable to make one wise. So three things she saw. It looks good. It's good for my eyes. It looks very beautiful. And it'll make me wise. So it, it's like the all, all three areas, you know, oh, this is too good. I cannot resist it. And she took the, the fruit and gave it to Adam. And then we see how the Lord confronts Adam first. And she, he says, she did it. And then yeah, the Lord comes to Eve. And what does the Lord ask Eve? In verse 13 it says, And the Lord God said to the woman, What is this you have done? The woman said, The serpent deceived me and I ate. So she realized after that, that she had been deceived. And that word deceived is a Hebrew word, noshaw. And it means to beguile, to lead astray, or to lend on interest. So we know that it means to deceive and beguile. But I was wondering at the word to lend on interest. Uh, it's like, you know, uh, these interest scams that you see going around. And I was just thinking about how sometime back, um, my, the, per, the lady who helps me, her son had st started a shop, a small shop. And suddenly he needed some money. And he saw these SMS of, of interest, uh, free loan, I mean interest, short, small interest, loans and something like that. And immediately he took some money from one or two loans, small amounts. And uh, shortly afterwards, they're pounding messages coming in saying that, oh, you have to pay with so much interest. And he started, he got very panicky. He took money from another loan and started trying to close it to the point where he couldn't keep quiet. He had to tell his mother. And then suddenly she got upset and they got, borrowed some money and paid it. But even after that, she, they got messages. And so this, she came to me and she was so upset. She said, madam, my son did a mistake. He got, he was... Uh, cheated and look what has happened and uh, she asked me for money and so my immediate reaction is thinking if I give her money even that will go it's not going to help her so I told her actually money is not the solution you need to solve the problem you've already given more than you took so we have to deal with this so I uh, asked her to go to the cyber police uh, in the city and actually they just gave a letter and everything was settled so we're seeing that how we can fall into deception and how this word, lending on interest, Satan was lending on interest. Eve thought, I'm getting something out of this deal. But there was so much interest attached to it. Many times in deception, that's what happens. There's so much attached to that de de deception and we lose so much. Yeah, so let's look into the New Testament about deception. If you look at the book of Galatians, it was written by Paul after, a, uh, Galatians was a, a, a number of churches in South Galatia, which was uh, established by Paul in the first missionary journey. And they started off really well. But in the course of some time, a group of people, Judaizers, that those are people who uh, decide that they're Christians, but they take up, they, they, decide, they decided to follow the Jewish customs. So they came and said that, all of you should follow the customs like circumcision, uh, eating just uh, kosher food, and, and many of the laws. And they brought it into the church. And when Paul heard about it, he was really, uh, he was annoyed. And he writes the letter to the Galatians. The whole theme of Galatians is to show them, reveal to them that they have been deceived. And usually in his letters, he'll write, uh, you know, I uh, appreciate you, he encourages them, he's, I'm so uh, happy to know that you're doing well. But in this letter, there's nothing like that. It goes straight to the point. And in verse um, 6 and 7, he says, I marvel that you are turning away so soon from him who called you in the grace of Christ to a different gospel which is not another, but there are some who trouble you and want to pervert the gospel of Christ. So actually, uh, it's a different gospel. It's not even a gospel. He's saying that what you're being taught is not a gospel, and you've perverted the gospel. I marvel, because you actually, you heard the message, and now look, you've turned away. And, in, uh, and he, he, he explains to them how they were deceived. In verse, uh, in uh, chapter 2, verse 16, he says, Knowing that a man 
is not justified by the works of the law, but by faith in Jesus Christ. Even we have believed in Christ Jesus, that we might be justified by faith in Christ and not by the works of the law. For by the works of the law, no flesh shall be justified. So very clearly, he, he's bringing in the truth. You were saved by faith and not by works. And that doesn't change. So he clearly tells them the truth. And in chapter 3, verse 1, he goes on to say, O foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you that you should not obey the truth before whose eyes Jesus Christ was clearly portrayed among you as crucified? So they had heard the gospel in such a way that they knew that Jesus had died for them. You had seen that. But who has bewitched you? I love that word. It's, I mean, I'm thinking, Paul, why did he use such a strong word? And bewitched, actually, it comes from a word uh, in Greek that is beskaino. And it means to cast a spell on. So it's such a strong word. Someone has cast a spell on you. It looks like that. So actually, uh, in those days, they thought that, uh, that snakes, it's like uh, when a snake tries, tries to hypnotize the prey, they used to think earlier that the snake hypnotizes the prey, but actually that's not a truth, that's a myth. Uh, it's just out of fear that the prey, that the, the prey just freezes. So, but they, uh, that this word comes from that, that you've been hypnotized like how a snake looks at you, and because of that, you've gone off track. So you should have focused on Jesus instead of on the eyes of the snake, of the enemy. So uh, that's why he used such a term, who bewitched you, but you, you saw Jesus Christ crucified. Um, and then he goes on to say in chapter 3, verses 26 to 28, for you are all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. For as many uh, as of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither slave nor free. There is neither male nor female, for you are all one in Christ. In Christ Jesus, you can be you. By faith, we are saved. We don't have to try to be anything else. You just have to believe and accept what he has done. So I was just thinking, are we being deceived? And the funny thing is, when you're deceived, you don't even realize it. No? That is the, the matter of, you won't even realize it. You kind of tend to believe something, some doctrine or something, and you think it's the truth. So how does anyone set you free? But the Lord is saying that you don't, should not be, you should guard yourself from being deceived. So to understand that, it's easy to be deceived and think that you're right. Yeah? And uh, Paul writes to Timothy in 2 Timothy chapter 4, verses 3 to 4. For a time is coming when people will no longer listen to sound and wholesome teaching. They will follow their own desires and will look for teachers who will tell them whatever their itching ears want to hear. They will reject the truth and chase after myths. So itching ears is people usually like to hear good things, comfortable things. You like everyone to compliment you, to say this is good. But it, no, it's the Lord is saying, no, you have to hear the truth and change accordingly. You know, as time goes by, a lot, of, a lot of us, we change the truth. We mix up the world. We have to please the world and the church. So we can mix both and, and you can really create a gospel which is not what Jesus wanted. So we, we have to be careful about that. And we can go into uh, deception. So what are the common areas where we can get deceived? So I was thinking, what are the common areas? And I found eight areas. There may be more. You can add on to the list, okay? But today I'm going to share eight areas where we commonly are deceived. The first one is deceived about our identity, about who we are. And we saw in the Garden of Eden how Eve was told that, okay, you, you'll become like God. But she didn't realize she was a son of God. Even now, I'm just telling you, everyone here and all those who are watching, if you've accepted Jesus as your savior, you are a child of God. Let no one say otherwise. Uh, I remember the first few years when I walked with the Lord. Uh, I, I didn't understand that truth. Uh, so I, I will still always think that actually, will 
am I really anything important in God's eyes? But when I started reading the word and understood, and when I started understanding that I am a child of God, everything changed. That deception changed completely. Because you know what it means to be a child of the home. You have that authority. You can put your legs up on the sofa. No? You, are, you can do what you want in your, within the, you know, the norms. But that, that is a privilege, that freedom that God has given us as children of God. Yeah? So first of all, we get deceived about our identity. The second thing is we're often deceived about the nature of God, how good he is. So I used to think, uh, yeah, I have a problem. I know God is able to do it, but will he do it for me? No, that was my sense. So even when I pray, something in my heart says, no, he may not do it for me. But as I read the word and understood his nature, that he is a good God, that if he could give his son for me, what he's not withheld anything from me, he is a good God. He is a good God. And uh, I'm thinking as a parent, we know that when our children, when they suffer a little bit also, our heart breaks. But how God the Father could give his son for you and me, he will know he's a good God. Don't let anyone say otherwise, because people bring theories. Oh, there's so much evil in the world, uh, so is God good? But it's a fallen world, and Satan is having a good time here. But truly, our God is good. Even if you read the Old Testament, uh, you see that every time Israel just went away or did the wrong thing, and they came back, God forgave them, and God just took them in. So he is a good God. Don't let anyone tell you otherwise. You need to read the word and reinforce that truth. And the third thing is we can be deceived by false teachings and false prophets. Matthew chapter 7 verses 14 and 16 says, Beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravenous wolves. You will know them by their fruits. You will be able to understand when you see, you know, from the way they speak, from their lifestyle, beware of those people. Uh, I think even as the prophecy is something that has probably blessed all of us, all of us should be, uh, take the prophecy and pray about it. Is this a word from God? Like I know there are times where I've read, I've received the right word, but there are times where the word has not been right. But I've taken it before the Lord and asked the Lord, is this from you? Uh, there are so many instances where people have made major decisions purely on prophecy. I've heard stories where people have sold their home because someone came and said, oh, this is evil or what that. But God always has given us the, the ability to ask him. Ask the Lord. If you have got a word, ask the Lord. Is this from you, Lord? Pray about it and the Lord will give you clarity. And take a decision only after you are sure about it. Even for when I came into ministry, uh, the first, I think one year before I came into ministry, I'm a doctor by profession, uh, and for the last five years I've been in ministry. So uh, one year before I came to ministry, I received a word about, okay, uh, it's, you should uh, go into ministry. But I prayed about it, and I knew that this is not the time. I didn't feel anything in me, and I just prayed about it. But then one year later, the Lord spoke to me. And then I decided to. And the Lord confirmed it through other people's words also. And I took that decision. So I was just thinking, sometimes prophecy may be right, but the timing may not be right. So you really have, God has given us that wisdom to pray about it and, you know, to live accordingly. Because it's our life. And you have to be, you're accountable to the Lord. And you have to ask, Lord, Lord, if this word has come, what should I do with it? Is it now? Is it later? So it's only when, the, when I was clear about it that I took the step and I knew, okay, that was the time. But one advantage I had, because the word came earlier, one year I prepared myself. So the word has come like this. I'm going to pray over it. I'm going to see at some time, if the Lord wants me to come into ministry, okay, I'll be ready. Lord, any time you tell me. So that, is, that was a real advantage for me that way. And test for false teachings. 1 Timothy chapter 6, verses 3 to 5 says, If anyone teaches otherwise and does not consent to wholesome words, even the words of our Lord Jesus Christ, and to the doctrine which accords with godliness, he is proud, knowing nothing, but is obsessed with disputes and arguments over words from which come envy, strife, reviling, 
evil suspicions, useless wranglings of men of corrupt minds and destitute of truth, who suppose that godliness is a means of gain. So the context here, Paul is written to Timothy. And just above that, he's talking about how that you as uh, those who are born servants honor your masters, if, if whether they're a believer or unbeliever. If they're a believer, honor them as brothers. If they're an unbeliever, it's because God wants you to honor them. And it's that context that he says, if anyone teaches you otherwise, beware. So, uh, so how do you decide? How, wh from this verse, we can understand some aspects about false teachings. The first thing is, false doctrine often teaches rebellion. And God does not, you know, approve of rebellion. Yeah? Uh, false doctrine often teaches rebellion. Secondly, uh, it teaches a wrong view of Christ. Not the, the, not the gospel in its ways, but a wrong view of Christ. Thirdly, it does not agree with godly teaching. Yeah? So when testing teaching or doctrine, we must ask, does it lead to holiness? Does it teach correctly about Christ? Does it agree with the rest of the scripture? And does it teach submission to authorities or rebellion? So the church in Berea, they were very wise. Even Paul, even though he's spoken in a number of churches, when he gave, shared the word there, they used to check the word. Every day they'll check the scriptures. Is this right? Is this in accordance with the scriptures? Same way, God has given us the word of God. Whatever teaching you receive, check it with the word of God. And now there are so many messages online on YouTube. And you can fill yourself with so many different types of words. But you have the responsibility to check it. You have the responsibility to guard yourself from false teachings. Yeah? So the, those are the three aspects. The fourth is we can be lukewarm. And uh, we can have an attitude that Jesus will not return any time now. Yeah? Um, so, but truly when we see the world, the way the world is going nowadays, it's like uh, so many unpredictable things, so many evil things, things that Jesus had spoken about are happening now. And I'd ask the Lord, I think we should pray, teach us, Lord, to number our days. We don't know how long we have. And that it's a deceive. We, we deceive ourselves to think that it's going to be a long time when Jesus comes back. We don't know the day, but we need to be ready. So in his letters to, uh, in the letter of uh, Revelation, uh, Paul, uh, uh, Jesus speaks to the church of Laodicea. Now, Laodicea was a very rich church. Uh, they had uh, textile industries, they had eye ointment, and different types of industries. A very rich, rich place, and the people in that church were really rich. And so Jesus admonishes them in uh, Revelation 3, verses 15 to 18. I know your works, that you are neither cold nor hot. I could wish you were cold or hot. So then, because you are lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will vomit you out of my mouth. Yeah? Jesus is giving a strong word for them because they're lukewarm. And then he says, why? Because you say, I am rich, I am wealthy, there's, I have need of nothing, but you don't realize 